All right, well, thank you so much, everybody, for uh, attending today. Um, I'm going to talk about AI. Uh, I'm going to talk about what it is, the history of it, uh, how it can apply to the things that we do uh, every day. Um, I know we have a QA session uh, after my slides, but you know, if if you see a moment where you have a question, just throw your hand up, and we'd love to make this as interactive as possible. All right, so what is AI? It's basically the branch of computer science uh, that aims to create intelligent machines, right? They're basically trying to mimic uh, human behavior uh, and, act, and actions, right? That's really the, the, the kind, of, kind of the core definition of artificial intelligence. And artificial intelligence, just conceptually, has been around for millennia. People have, even, even when you talk about uh, uh, the Egyptians and Romans and, and the gods and the spirits, it's all about this omnipresent power uh, to, to help uh humanity right so this is something that has evolved uh, over 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 a long period of time uh and ai is with us in everything that we do it's already in your phones uh it's in your personal assistants like siri and google assistant you know you've got recommendation systems with netflix and other things that are basically you know telling you or, or, or learning from your behaviors and making recommendations to you if you've been to a border crossing there's facial recognition that's built into those systems. So these are things that are happening every single day. So we interact with AI all the time, even with, if like I've got the example of Fitbit uh, or an Apple Watch, it's tracking your heart rates and all that stuff. That's all AI powered uh, under, the, under the covers. And if, you know, if you're taking a picture with your phone and you see the little square that's on somebody's face when you're taking the picture, that's, that's basically face detection uh, on your phone. That's, that's AI. Uh, and when you, when you open, if you have an iPhone and you use uh, and you, you open your phone, uh, that's facial recognition. So it's learned your face to open your phone. That's that's AI today. So what are the types of AI? Now there's a lot of words here, but I'll just kind of talk to you. And you know, at a, at a high level, there's three kind of categories: there's narrow AI, general AI, and then super intelligent AI, at least conceptually. So narrow AI is what's typically found in AI systems today. What that means is uh, AI system, algorithms or systems have been trained for a specific purpose. So I talked about face ID uh, on your app, on your iPhone. That's a very narrow use case trained for a very specific purpose. If you're a security camera and you're doing uh, people counting, uh, that's a specific use case. Uh, if your if your your autonomous vehicle has hundreds of very very narrow AI use cases to cover a lot of the things that are going on with the more autonomous systems that you're starting to see uh, in vehicles today. So narrow AI is basically where, where we are, where we're standing today, you know, very focused application based uh, AI. Okay. Uh, general AI is when we go from narrow to be able to essentially cross domains. What do I, what do I mean by that? Uh, AI that can listen, that can understand, that can communicate, that can learn uh, and can do basically things that a human can do, okay? We're not there yet. Uh, and I put yet in quotes because there's a huge debate in the, in the AI space right now uh, about how close we actually are to artificial general intelligence. What Jeffrey Hinton, uh, I don't know if this is a name that's, that you've heard of, uh, he's a professor at U of T, um, Toronto, uh, worked at Google for many, many years. He's considered the godfather of AI. He resigned from AI last year to speak out because he's terrified <laughs> of what's happening with AI. And he didn't want to be encumbered by his position at Google uh, in order to speak you know, candidly about his opinions. Now, he's not the only person who thinks this. There's a lot of others that do as well. Uh, but there's also a lot of people in the field that are basically saying, no, nah, it's, it, it's fine. We can control it probably as well. We can, we're going to talk a bit more about that. Uh, and then super intelligent AI, this is like really hypothetical. This is where now the machines are smarter than people. All right. And this is where we start getting into uh, the realm of risk, uh, ethics, uh, and, and serious concern. Because all of a sudden, if you've got uh, systems that know more than we do, uh, then how do, you, how do you control that at some point? Right. So those are the three kind of high, high level areas of AI. So the, I won't get into all the details here, but you know, in context of the history, you know, it was really in the '40s and '50s uh, that there was the early works. So, does anybody anybody see the movie *Imitation Game*? 
Yeah, great movie, right? Alan Turing. Uh, that's basically sort of the genesis of a lot of this kind of thought. Uh, and that was the, and he created this concept of the Turing test, which basically means uh, it's like an experiment where you have, you interact with a person, you interact with the machine, uh, and if you can't tell the difference, then the machine has passed the Turing test. Uh, and that, that's, that's a concept that's still being used today. Uh, the term artificial intelligence was first used uh, in 1956 at this conference in Dartmouth, at Dartmouth University, uh, where these minds came together and started talking about the, the use of algorithms uh, to do things uh, for us. Uh, and this was really the start of what was called the first AI. Movement. So all of a sudden, people got excited. Uh, and when people get excited, that means companies are getting excited. That means companies are throwing money at the, problem, at, at the solution. A uh, lot of investment, a lot of research, a lot of stuff going on uh, in about in that 20 year period. Um, and then around 1975, people started realizing that they sunk a lot of money into a technology that wasn't reaping a lot of benefits at the time. And the primary reason for that was the computers just were not there to, to actually be able to process the algorithms that were being contemplated. So the math was way ahead uh, of the of the processing problem. Okay, so that's and that basically started what was called the AI winter. So there was this period of time where everybody sort of abandoned it and it was like, okay, this is all really cool theory, theory stuff. Uh, and they went on to, to do other things. Uh, and then the money started following uh, specific narrow use cases, which, which what they called expert systems. So they started to realize, okay, well, we can build very focused systems that will solve certain types of problems using data. All right. And all of a sudden there was this resurgence because companies could use it, they could monetize it, et cetera, et cetera. So it started to come back uh, into fashion. Uh, enter the 90s and all of a sudden the, the hardware, the chips, which we're not going to talk too much about, but that's a huge part of the whole AI story is the semiconductor industry and how quickly they've been able to improve the processing power uh, of certain chips. We're going to talk about the video in a little bit. Uh, but all of a sudden, the processing power caught up to the to the to the the, the algorithms, uh, and people like Jeffrey Hinton uh, decided to jump back into the fray, uh, and they started to do more and more experiments. And this is how AI started to come back. Uh, all of a sudden, it didn't take you know a year of theoretical processing power to do an algorithm. They could do it you know in a few days or a few weeks in terms of training. We'll talk about that as well. So that's where you start getting into machine learning. So you mentioned machine learning. Which is a subset of AI. I'll talk about that, and this concept of a neural network. I'll talk about that as well. The GPUs. This is where it really kind of took off. You know, 2000 to 2020. Now all of a sudden, we're starting to get breakthrough technologies: computer vision, natural language processing, robotics. Uh, we're we're going to talk about generative generative AI and ChatGPT. These are all things that are now up, up, that can be done because of the horsepower behind the the, 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 the technology. Okay, so we talked about AI, you know, really this concept of having a machine act like, act like, act like a human uh, or perform like a human. Uh, machine learning uh, is essentially a subset uh, of artificial intelligence. So basically algorithms that are trained uh, with data. Now, machine learning is very powerful, but it is somewhat limited because the amount of data that you can run on a machine learning model is, is, is there's only so much you can do because a lot of it has to be manually curated. Okay, so powerful, but limited. Uh, deep learning, on the other hand, is where this thing kind of really exploded. So deep learning, I'll talk a bit more about what that looks like, but essentially taking the algorithms and modeling it off of what your brain does. So the way the neural network of your brain operates, that's essentially what the concept of a deep neural network is, kind of mimicking those capabilities. And I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, as well. Deep learning, on the other hand, you know, whereas machine learning, you have to feed only, you can only feed it so much data. Deep learning actually requires an, a tremendous amount of data because it actually is learning from that data. So uh, using the example of face detection, uh, you have to show a deep neural network uh, thousands of faces so that it can recognize what a face is. It picks out the features. It's like, okay, I see eyes, I see a nose, I see ears, I see facial hair. I see not facial hair. I see hair, not hair. It has to learn all of this stuff in order to determine whether this is a face, right? So there's a ton, a ton of data that's required to train a deep neural network. Okay. There's other concepts of how these networks can learn as well. 
concept called reinforcement learning. This is kind of like the, the carrot and the stick, where you put the AI in the real world, uh, and based off of what it's how it interacts, you give it either a sort of a reward uh, or a penalty. It's like if you want it to do certain thing, then it gets this reward. If it does the, what you don't want it to do, uh, it gets this penalty, and it kind of learns from that. And then all of a sudden, you're 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 you're, couch, you're coaching the behavior uh, of the model. Uh, Sony, which is one of our clients, they they've uh, just recently uh, introduced an AI racing bot inside of Gran Turismo that uses all reinforcement learning. That's basically how the car knows how to stay on the track, how to get around the other cars. Uh, and it learned over a period of about a year of, uh, of working on this uh, the Sony team uh, to get this bot to actually work and compete at a really, really high level. It's pretty cool, actually. It does really, really well. It does. So they're, they actually have, I didn't know this, <laughs> they actually have like international competitions on Gran Turismo. Uh, and the top racers of the world, they had they had them race against these bots, and it, it was uh, it was pretty fascinating. Yeah. I actually had one of some people from Sony speak to my class about this. Uh, and then one of the newest concepts, uh, and this is more around the field of robotics, is what's called imitation learning. So if you've got a robot and you want to teach that robot how to pick up something, walk over to another place, put it somewhere else, you can basically. Do it yourself while it's watching you and it learns from you kind of like a kid <laughs> training a kid uh and that's basically called imitation learning. so they learn by seeing demonstrations of things that you want them to you want them to do so a neural network this is about as technical as i'm going to get i promise so basically a neural network as i said it's it's kind of like a brain right so the idea is you've got these layers inside of this network now this is obviously just a two uh, or a four layer uh, network a deep neural network, one of the reasons it's called deep is because there can be hundreds or thousands of these layers. And the idea is you feed it information on the input side, and then it makes a decision on the output side. That's really basically how it's like a black box. Uh, and all the machinations of, of these layers in between is how it comes to its decision, right? This is why it requires so much data, because if it's not trained well, then the accuracy of the output is not going to be that great. So the idea is to train your models to make them as accurate as possible to get them uh, to get the result that you want uh, as many times as possible. It's not perfect. That's why AI today, you need to check the responses you get. It's just not always going to give you the exact right answer. Okay. So that's kind of the, 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 the notion uh, of, a, of a deep neural network and how it works. Yeah. Uh, how involved is the human uh, interacting with building the input versus like because like you know, how curating is that process? That's a that's actually a really good question. So basically, there's kind of two ways of training. Well, there's more than that, but at a high level, there's two ways of tra of, of thinking about how you train an AI model. Uh, one is called supervised, and the other is called unsupervised. So it's what what supervised means really is. In this particular example, if you want to figure out what kind of an, of an animal is in, a, is in an image, for example, you know, you have to feed it, you know, as I mentioned with the face example, you know, thousands of examples of, of cats, dogs, depending on how many classes you want this, this deep neural network to, to understand. Uh, in this case, this is a two class model, dog or cat. Uh, so you have to, you have to feed it all these images and these images have to be labeled. That's what the, that's what supervised learning means. You, you basically create this massive data set of different pictures of cats, and they're all labeled cat, and that's how it works. So one of the you know the, some of the dark side of AI is that the, the curation of data, training data, like there's companies that have you know armies of people in low wage countries in Africa and Asia that all they do is look at images of labels. And that's to create data sets that are, which really the data is the gold of AI, because you need data for AI to operate properly. So labeling data, that's one of the key things. So that's the supervised part. Unsupervised learning is basically you just give it a bunch of information and you let the AI figure it out itself. So that's what ChatGPT does. ChatGPT was basically unleashed on the entire internet. That's how it's learned all the information that it has. So it's basically they they parceled off pieces of ChatGPT to go search the internet and just learn everything it possibly could. It essentially scraped the entire internet. 
uh, and learn from it, which is why not, I mean, what's the percentage of things that are 100% accurate on the internet, right? <laughs> so that, that's kind of the scary part, right? So like, what did it learn really? Uh, so like, and what is it regurgitated? Which is why you gotta go back and check what, what you get out of it. But bottom line is more data uh, means bigger models. So they're huge, uh, but also means better accuracy uh, in terms of the result. So better accuracy means, makes, means better decision. You know, you don't want a, 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 a braking system on your car to be 70% accurate. Right? That's, that's, that's kind of scary. All right, so one of the other dark uh, sort of underbelly issues with AI is incredibly resource intensive. So you have these giant models uh, that have to be trained with millions and millions of data points, right? The human brain requires about 20 watts of energy. We've got an incredibly efficient processing power in our bodies, right? That's, that's and from what, and considering what we can do with our brains, quite amazing. Uh, an NVIDIA A100 GPU, uh, that's about 7.5 megawatts per hour that it would, that it can, so that's just one GPU. Just to provide some context, chat GPT required over a thousand of these GPUs and it ran for 34 days. To train them, to train that model. So that's the estimate is about 250 megawatts of power that was consumed just training that model, and you know 500 plus metric tons of CO2 emissions just in that training exercise. ChatGPT4 is way bigger, right? It's said to have two trillion parameters versus 175. We're not to talk about parameters, but the estimate is there was about 5,000 of those GPUs used to train ChatGPT4. Mm -hmm. So to put that in context. The NVIDIA's latest chip, the, the H100, the, the CD Insights basically predicted that if all of the, the units of the H100 are running in, in 2024, it's going to consume more power than the entire state of Georgia, the country of Guatemala, Costa Rica, about a million U.S. households. So, you know, when you go to Home Depot and they force you to buy a little LED light for your house, think about what NVIDIA is doing and how much power they're consuming. But it's, it's quite incredible, actually. And the cost of training, you know, running these models and training these models, uh, just, you know, we're not getting into all, all the weeds here, but, you know, GPT-4, the estimate was about 70, almost 79 million to train. Just That's just processing power, running these GPUs. Google Gemini, which is the latest uh, multimodal model, we'll talk about that in a little bit, that came out, almost 200 to train. Like, this is expensive. And that's basically running all of these GPUs in all of these data centers all over the world. So NVIDIA, I talked about those chips. NVIDIA has just joined the $2 trillion market cap club uh, because everybody's buying their gear, because everybody's training models all over the place. It's, it's quite incredible. Even like a deep light, you know, we've got maybe eight of these things. And luckily we bought them a few years back because they're, they're, Four or five times the price than what we what we originally put. And that's just the training part. You know, when you run AI, that's called inference. So when if you're in chat GPT and you prompt it, you say, Can you generate me uh, a paragraph on XYZ? That and, and then it starts thinking and then it gives you a response. That's what's called inference. So basically you feed it an input, it runs through the neural network, and it gives you a result. Okay. We're in this transition phase. The last you know, five, six years, there's been a ton of training going on because we're still in the infancy, right? We're still getting AI systems built. We're doing experimentation. The use of AI, it's just starting to happen, especially now that it's getting in the hands of, of everybody through, uh, through the tools that are being built. So they're, they're predicting that inference costs are gonna be 80 to 90% of the total spend uh, on AI. So if we're talking, but those numbers that I was showing you, if that's just training, imagine once we start using AI at scale across sometimes billions of people, it's huge. ChatGPT four, they're estimating it, they're going to have about twenty five thousand of these of uh, uh, these H one hundreds just to, to accommodate the hundred million users that they've signed up. They've actually capped the number of people that can sign up to ChatGPT four to, 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 to kind of regulate. The use of this inference. Like it's kind of crazy. Okay, so what kind of technologies 
uh, are out there. So we've talked about you know what AI is and kind of how it works at uh, high level. Um, so what are the kinds of things that you can do? So this is actually an image of uh, Tesla autopilot. Okay, so this is a visual of what's going on here. That's what you're seeing. So you can see all kinds of detection uh, and processing that's going on. You can see segmentation of lanes. You can see detection of vehicles. Uh, you can see distances and spaces. There's lots of things that are going on. So this is many, many models running at the same time concurrently uh, on autopilot. So that's a great example uh, of, a, of an AI use case. But, you know, other things, natural language processing, the ability to essentially communicate uh, with AI. So some of you can experience some of this stuff, uh, even in series of public example, right? Where you, 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 you interact and it speaks back to you. Um, audio, you know, AI can hear, it can process sounds, uh, it can understand language. Uh, computer vision, there's a whole sphere of things we can talk about with computer vision, but that's basically, you know, AI that can see. And then that can ascertain uh, things that are going on around them uh, through vision. So we're essentially, we're kind of like, how are we mimicking the five senses, right? We've got hearing, we've got vision, uh, there's taste and smell AI systems that are out there. Um, all of this stuff sort of culminating uh, into the parallel advancements that are happening in robotics. So you've got all this crazy AI stuff that's happening, but the the acceleration of the technology around robotics is quite incredible. We're going to show some examples of that uh, in a little bit. But you're going to see, when we talk about trends, this is the convergence, right? It's this convergence of AI systems uh, and mobile systems. Uh, that's why uh, Mark Zuckerberg has basically said that one limitation of AI right now is, is power. Because, you know, even if you have an army of robots, they need to run on batteries. So that's the limitation. Right now, that's the only control we have. We can unplug them. <laughs> So what is generative AI? You know, th these perception-based systems like computer vision and audio and NLP, these are things that are, you know, we've, they've been around for a while. You may or may not have noticed them, but now that we've got this whole generative AI concept, uh, that's really kind of democratized this whole concept of AI. Because now it's in everybody's desktop who's using it. So what is generative AI? It's, it's essentially, it's AI that can generate content based off of a, of a, a request or what they call a prompt. So in the case of ChatGPT, it's a that you have a prompt uh, and you get text, right? So ask it a question, get an answer. So here's a perfect example. You know, I asked the question, what is AI? And it just started to be the answer. So what does that mean? Well, I call it the answer era. All right. So we went, like if you look at the last 30 years, right? Some of some of you are my generation, you were a little older. You have card catalog era. Right? You needed to go do some research. If you needed to find something, what did you do? You had to go to the library, you had to open these little drawers, you had to do Dewey Decimal System stuff. And it's like, I need to figure out something about agriculture. And then you go find the six books and the five that are not there <laughs> and, and panic. And you know, you all remember that. Uh, and then figure it all out. Well, then, you know, all of a sudden, we get out of the card catalog area and we into the, the into the blue lake era, the search era. So now Google comes along and I want to do some research on agriculture. Well, I just need to go into Google and say, can you give me some information on agriculture? Blah, 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 blah. And you get all of these links. Great. And, and the algorithms of Google are trying to prioritize the links based off of what you asked for, because they've got some pretty cool search algorithms back. Uh, and then once you get through all the sponsor you get to the real information um, but you still got to do your homework right like you got to click these links you got to see if they're useful you got to read the content you got to say okay what's relevant what's not relevant what am i going to use what am i not going to use still takes time right now we're in the answer what is ai here's my answer right so i i i, I worry and I, I talk to my students about this about brain atrophy right the, those first two require work. You know, you have to exercise your brain to learn something. This, this, if we if we just trust this, this is where it gets a little bit scary. You gotta that that answer isn't necessarily the right answer, right? Or it may not be the best answer. But yeah. By people. Like literally. So like open AI, Google. They have armies of people that that hit the the algorithm, uh, get the responses, and and 
basically filter things that are wrong or bad. Like, like you can't go to ChatGPT and say, hey, uh, there's a bank uh, in uh, Niagara on the Lake, a TV on this corner. What's the best way to break into this bank and steal anything? It's not going to give you that answer. It's not allowed to, right? Um, but there's, I don't know if you saw some of the uh, Google Gemini when they first released, uh, there was this big kerfuffle about people trying to get um, Google Gemini to generate a white person. And it, it, it wouldn't do it. It was, it was kind of weird because they sort of overcorrected for bias and discrimination. Uh, you know, there was people that were, you know, basically saying, give me images of, of U.S. presidents. Uh, and they were all minorities. There was a one that somebody asked, show, show, me, a, show me a pope. And it was uh, an Indian female, right? It just, it didn't line up to reality, but that was just because of the way they were sort of uh, maybe overcompensating to make sure that they weren't introducing, you know, traditional, you know, bias that we see every single day. So it's a work in progress, progress to answer your question. You had a question as well? Yeah, I have a question as well. Well, this is what, so Google is trying to incorporate AI into search. Uh, and this is one of the things that Google is kind of freaking out about. And one of the reasons they were a little bit rushed to get Gemini out uh, is because it's a threat to their ad business, right? It's a huge threat to their ad business. Uh, and that's, that's the engine that powers Google. Right. So, yeah, it's a good question. Other questions? Yes. Yeah. And it's actually, there's this now this whole school called, of thought called prompt engineering, uh, where you can learn how to do prompt, good prompting, depending on what you're looking for. Right. That's bias right there. That's a really good example of bias. Yeah. That's all right. When I go to my smart doorbell, I get the message on my phone that it's that the that is found somebody who doesn't recognize me. I installed you. Um, okay, so that chat GPT is like prompt to text, but that's not the only way of generating AI. We've got prompt to image. So there's a, a system called DALI, also owned by OpenAI. Uh, so, I mean, look at this. Look at this image. This is the prompt. I don't know if you can read that, but a 3D render of a coffee mug placed on a window, blah, 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 blah. Generate me an image. And this is what it created. So when you talk about workplace, right? Like if you're in the creative industry, you know, is this an opportunity or is this a threat, right? If you're a graphic designer, you know, if if I can do it, why do I need one? Why do I need a graphic designer? All right, why do I need a marketing firm? Why do I have to pay somebody to do this when I can just prompt this and say, oh, you know what? I didn't quite like this cup. You put it in a different size cup, put it in a beer mug or something like that. Right. And Sora, again, also opening up, uh, this is prompt to video. So look at this. Look at this prompt. Historical footage of California during the gold rush. That's pretty good, <laughs> right? And and this is actually there's even more interesting videos uh, that are being generated by Sora, right? So again, if you're in cinematography, if you're in the movie industry, if you make commercials, if you had to build this set and have a hundred people working behind the scenes and a, a, a drone flying overhead to do that aerial shot, think of the the, the savings that go along with just AI generated content. So that's generative AI. Yeah, I heard that Tyler Perry was going to build something with a hundred million dollar movie studio. He saw this technology and said, "Scrap the place." That's exactly right. He absolutely did. He's like, "Yeah, time out. We're we're something is changing." Uh, so he so he's like, "I'm waiting. We're going to wait before we do this." Um, okay, so we've talked about perception type of AI, so vision, uh, you know, hearing, audio. Uh, we've talked about generative AI, so being able to have AI create certain things. And then I mentioned robotics, right? Uh, and this kind of convergence uh, of robotics. 
the notion of crossing domains, you know, vision, hearing, touch, uh, mobility, uh, that's what they call multimodal AI. So it's kind of bringing all of these things together into kind of a single type of system, right? Uh, it, so combining that perception and generative AI into, into one thing. So this gets us one step closer to that artificial general intelligence, right? Because all of a sudden, you can interact with something and I'll show you. So this is, uh, there's a company called Figure that makes uh, robots uh, and they've just added open AI to chat GPT. Hey, figure one, what do you see right now? I see a red apple on a plate in the center of the table, a drying rack with cups and a plate, and you standing nearby with your hand on the table. Great, can I have something to eat? Sure thing. Great. Can you explain why you did what you just did while you pick up this trash? On it. So I gave you the apple because it's the only uh, edible item I could provide you with from the table. Great. So based on the scene right now, where do you think the dishes in front of you go next? The dishes on the table, like that plate and cup, are likely to go into the drying rack next. Great, can you put them there? Of course. All right, so how do you think you did? I, I think I did pretty well. The apple found its new owner, the trash is gone, and the tableware is right where it belongs. I agree. Thanks, figure one. You're welcome. If there's anything else you need help with, just let me know. So as an AI guy, that was fascinating and terrifying all at once. <laughs> So, I mean, basically, that was that was pretty incredible, right? I mean, except this one. I don't like that. Um, but, you know, that was a complete conversation. Uh, I don't know if you noticed, but uh, they also sort of trained the audio to sound a little bit more human. Uh, there was like a couple of Oz and stuff in there. So it wasn't just computer generated sound. It sounded like you were conversing with an individual. You noticed the lag though, right? So that's that's actually another AI concept called latency, where there's a, a, a delay in the processing of the information. So latency is another area, a field of AI, where people are trying to get these things to, to run faster and faster, because that, that lag time is such a kind of a conversation. What are you thinking about? So yeah, so one step closer to AGI. Okay, so let's let's get to business here. So AI and business. How am I doing for time? I'm terrible at plant monitoring my time. Good. Okay, perfect. Uh, okay, so AI is, and we're going to talk about this in the Q and A, or if you have any questions now. But you know, there's lots of transformation that's going on in businesses, just like yours, right? So fun, typically white collar functions at this point. Although uh, Figure One is looking to kind of help with that with the robots. Uh, but, you know, marketing, HR, finance, legal, these are areas uh, that are sort of right for this type of technology because it can really, really accelerate how you accomplish tasks. So it isn't necessarily, um, you know, about replacing jobs. It's about being more productive uh, with the resources you have, all right? Although it, it which can translate into to less resources required, of course. Um, it can obviously automate very repetitive tasks. So if that's something in your business that is painful, uh, that's an area of opportunity. 
uh, provides, in, if you have a ton of data, remember I talked about data being gold. If you're an organization that generates a lot of data, especially if it's proprietary data in a particular industry, uh, you, you're sitting on a gold mine potentially uh, to create solutions around whatever problem you're trying to solve. Uh, and then of course, you and some of you probably have already inter interacted with chatbots and things of that nature. Uh, you know, they're they're designed to improve the customer experience. I'm not sure it's 100 percent successful <laughs> yet, because uh, I find them sometimes quite irritating. Um, but that's again the, this notion of communicating and using in from using technology at scale to interact with the customer base, right? Uh, I'll give you a couple of uh, case study examples of how some, some larger companies are using AI. So Amazon, uh, you know, if, you're, if anybody buys stuff from Amazon, uh, when you log into Amazon, uh, there's suggestions for you. There's re reminders of things you may have looked at before. That's all part of the AI algorithms behind Amazon processing the data based off of your interaction with the platform. So it is. So this is a recommendation engine. It is constantly looking to guide you to a to a purchase, uh, and that's what's really going on behind the scenes. Help you find what you're looking for. And it's all based off of you know what you view, how long you spend on a specific item, uh, how many times maybe you visited that item, those sorts of things. And then if they they find similar things, and you've seen that before, it's like, well, if you've got this, you may you may be interested in this. Starbucks has AI all over the place, and in supply chain, they've got this massive platform called Deep Brew. Uh, it's basically their, their AI strategy. So they've rolled out AI in their supply chain, uh, in the way the stores operate, how to manage the drive-throughs. All of that stuff is controlled because there's massive, massive amounts of data. It's built into, I don't know if, you've got, if you have the Starbucks app, uh, it's completely built into that. The stars that you get, the purpose of that app is not to give you stars. The purpose of that app is to get your data. <laughs> Right, the, 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 the stars are the reward function. It's like, oh, I got stars. Like, thank you for giving us more data. Uh, and that's how, they, that's how they make their decisions. Uh, American Express, this is kind of a cool one. So fraud obviously is a massive uh, concern, uh, particularly with credit cards. Um, uh, American Express has implemented um, a, a global AI solution uh, that basically in real time will as assess uh, each and every transaction that's processed through their phone. And it will make essentially a, a millisecond decision of whether it thinks it's fraud. And that's, again, based off of, if Amex has been around for a long time. They've got a tremendous amount of data uh, in terms of historical transactions, good and bad. Uh, and they've been able to train this system to, with a pretty good degree of reliability, flag fraudulent transactions uh, and, uh, and then act on them. Uh, Google, so we talked about all the power consumption in the data centers. Well, Google's actually trying to use AI to address some of this. Uh, so they've got uh, DeepMind is a, is a Google company uh, that focuses on AI. It's kind of like an open AI. Uh, and they use technology from DeepMind uh, to implement uh, basically a monitoring solution across all of their data centers to try to reduce the cost uh, and, 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 and echo footprint of the cooling of these data centers. And they were able to get that down to about 40%. Now, 40% sounds good, but in the context of the really large numbers we were talking about earlier, they still have some work to do. Um, but you know, basically, they've got thousands of sensors all over the place gathering data. And based on that data, they will react and adjust the parameters of the data center uh, so they can fine tune the cooling uh, of that particular location. Uh, fun fact, uh, in 2000, this is a stat from 2022, Microsoft used uh, over two, the equivalent of over 2,500 Olympic sized swimming pools worth of water to cool its data centers. Yeah. yeah. Matthew lives in California, works in Facebook, and you can't get that new job. So, the same thing as the Yeah. Yeah. Well, Microsoft is investing in, in modular nuclear reactor technology. At Amazon, uh, Amazon owns uh, AWS, which is their data centers. They just bought a data center that sits right next to a nuclear uh, power generation station in Pennsylvania. And they have a contract with the power generator to power that data center directly from the nuclear reactor. So the, 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 this is, the scale of this is, is absolutely massive. And we're just, at the, we're just on the ground floor, right? Yeah. Microsoft just pulled off their underwater. Uh, yeah. 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 Ye
Yeah, because it makes sense, right? Yeah, and you you would think that Canada, uh, based off even some of our northern territories, might be an interesting location for something. Stuff. All right, so AI in your business. So let's talk about things that we can do. Uh, so first of all, of course, there's cost savings. You know, AI can automate routine tasks. Uh, I'm going to use and give you a real real life example uh, of something that I did. Uh, improve customer experience. We talked about the chatbots. We talked about it's not even just chatbots. Uh, the idea of actually having a person uh, speaking to somebody, but with information that's being presented to the person, so that they're giving you the best experience, right? Like if you're having a conversation with your financial planner, uh, and there's information based off of the profile of your customer. Uh, and you're getting that information from the system, you can have a more engaged conversation with your customer rather than some sort of generic discussion, right? Uh, I've mentioned the fact that AI can process lots and lots of data. So if you've got lots of data, that's a good, that's a good area of opportunity. Uh, and then productivity. Uh, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you a really good example uh, of productivity. So here's, this is me. This is what I did just very recently. So uh, we're a deep tech company. I've got PhD student, uh, students, I got PhDs. I've got PhD, uh, master's level uh, deep learning engineers. Uh, we do, we don't just build systems. We also do some fundamental research. This is a research paper that was recently accepted uh, to an organization called ICCB. We don't have to get into the weeds of what that paper is. But I know about, I, I can understand about 10% of it. <laughs> if I were to just read it on its own. Uh, it's a 26 page research paper, but I wanted to do some marketing around that. So I basically went into Copilot in Microsoft, which is essentially ChatGPT. Uh, and I said, okay. And I didn't even have to feed it the document. I basically said, here's the paper. It's on archive. Here's the title of the paper. Can you write me a blog? A, five, a 750 word blog. So it read the paper, generated this blog for me. I sent the blog to Ivan, one of my PhDs. I said, how's this? Uh, he said, good. He corrected one or two sentences. I changed the tone so that it sounded more like me as opposed to AI uh, and published the blog. And then I said, chat to BD. Here's my blog. I need a LinkedIn post. Give me a LinkedIn post. I tweaked that. And in a couple hours, I did an entire marketing campaign with on this program. Had without this, this is how it would have went down. Um, marketing would have got the, the, the research paper, read it, and be like, I don't know what to do this. <laughs> then they would have got on the phone with Ivan. Ivan would have explained it. Marketing wouldn't have understood it. They would get on the phone again. Ivan would be irritated at this point. They would have this would this would go on for about a week. Then they'd have a draft. That would maybe go to Sud, who's Ivan's boss. Sud would have his own opinions. We would go back and forth. Blog would finally get finished, probably after a couple of weeks, uh, and then it would get published. You know, and if that was an external firm, which is what we were using at the time, you know, that would have been a few thousand bucks to go through that exercise. So this is just a you know a real life example of how each and every one of you can start to use these types of tools because they're on your desktop. Okay, so what are the challenges uh, of implementing AI solutions? So first of all, training data, all right? Uh, I talked about data being bold, and I talked about the dirty little secret of uh, armies of people labeling data and all that kind of stuff. So data is kind of hard to come by, right? And hard to curate. So if you don't have data, that's typically the biggest problem uh, in getting started with AI, if you have a very unique solution. Uh, if, it, if it's not unique, uh, like if you can use public data sets, like if you're looking for person count gain, uh, face detection, you can get open source data, like data sets that you could use to train, train models for that kind of stuff. But anything proprietary, uh, that requires work. Okay. Data privacy as well. You know, if you feed the chat GPT is in the cloud, right? Chat GPT trained across the entire internet. If you feed something, some of your secret sauce into chat GPT, are you training chat GPT on your secret sauce? Like that's not good. So that's something you need to be careful about. That's why most enterprises today, uh, like banks, insurance companies, things of that nature, they're not using these public sources. They either have their own private version of it, or they're bringing in these solutions inside of their own environment because they don't want their data getting out there and having these systems trained on 
proprietary and private information. So we've got to be very cognizant of that. Uh, so that's the data security part. Uh, you know, job displacement, uh, AI can certainly create jobs. Uh, I think if you're in product management and that can run teams that are building products that are at, at, at a rapid pace and at scale using AI, that's a great, great opportunity. But it can also displace workers. You know, we talked about the example of, of uh, you know, if you're in cinematography and all of a sudden you can use AI to generate all of this stuff. You know, that's the kind of stuff. Honestly, there's never been a, bit, a better time to get a hard hat and a toolbox. Uh, and uh, and get out there because those those jobs are low risk AI at this point. But if you're the estimator inside of a construction company, you got to be careful. You know, this technology might 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 leak, might might uh, lack you. Uh, bias. We talked about bias. You know, poorly designed AI may make just bad decisions. All right. I know we're going to talk a little bit about hiring practices. That's a, that's a big issue actually in that area. Uh, implementation costs, it can be very, very expensive. Uh, you saw some of the costs to train models. This is non-trivial. You know, if you're if you're literally trying thinking that you're going to build your own AI system from scratch, uh, the implementation costs are are, are, are not are, are not even including curating the data are very, very high. Uh, and then last but not least, uh, regulation. You know, governments are now starting to step in. Uh, the European Union just released their AI Act. Canada's working on it. It's one of the things that we're we're, we're actually lobbying uh, with, with the Canadian Chamber of Commerce because we want to make sure that, you know, while we recognize that guardrails need to be in place, we don't want Canada to be in a position where we are being held back relative to other jurisdictions in terms of AI advancement. So it's a bit of a tug of war. So, you know, if, if, if we don't, uh, you know, ethically deploy AI solutions and, and bad things happen, this is when governments tend to step in uh, and kind of drop the hammer. So you got to be very careful. Uh, this is kind of hard to see. To, to, to see. Um, I'll, we'll be sharing the slides, but basically this was a study by a company called SnapLogic, uh, well, for employees in the US and the UK, uh, and sort of the positives that are coming from the employee workforce. You know, people who are adopting this and seeing the positive impact to their jobs, uh, and even in some cases, their work-life balance, you know, some of the statistics. Here, which we'll, uh, I, I can share in the deck. Okay, so preparing uh, your business for AI. Okay, so first of all, you know, obviously everybody here is doing different things, uh, different priorities, but the idea is to think about here, based on some of the things we talked about, maybe there's areas that you can identify that says, hey, you know what, we've got some bottlenecks, we've got some issues that can require uh, some, some solutions. So let's think about what those are. How can we, how can we improve uh, in those areas? Um, Look to your vendors, okay? Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a big proponent of buy versus build, especially when you're talking about AI systems. So depending on what systems you're using and what your, your vendors uh, are supplying you, uh, what are they doing? Are they implementing solutions that can be of value uh, to you? You know, if you're, even if you're a QuickBooks user uh, or um, Photoshop, there, there's AI tools that are being built into these systems. You know, get familiar with these tools. They're, they're, they're there for a reason, all right? Uh, start small uh, and get comfortable with the concept. I mean, I use the example of the marketing operations. There's lots of content generation uh, that can be done using uh, using AI. Uh, train, training your, there's, there's courses that are out there. Uh, training your, yourself, training your employees. Uh, to, to get better, to get comfortable uh, with AI, uh, developing the plan uh, to make sure that you've got this part of sort of your strategic rollout for a, a given period of time, uh, and you know depending on the scope uh, of what you're doing, you may you may need to have, bring in some AI experts uh, and potentially even some technologists to help you implement your solution depending on the scope and scale of what you're contemplating. Okay. So. In, Context of the future, you know, the AI is really, as, as it is today with phones and AI assistants, which is kind of ubiquitous, we're going to start to see that same type of ubiquitous implementation of AI just in everyday business activities, all right? It's, it's just going to be there. Um, but if we resist and if we fail to adapt, uh, there's a risk of falling behind uh, your competitors uh, in your space. Um, AI is going to create jobs. AI is going to kill jobs. Uh, it really depends on what business you're in, uh, and that's just kind of the way it's going to be. Uh, there's a uh, 
a, a recent story, uh, I can't remember the name of the company, uh, but they basically claim that their AI agent has replaced the equivalent of, of 700 call centers. Um, they were bragging about that. I'm not sure that's a great story, but uh, it's it, it's a, and certainly operationally, it's an interesting story. It's not a great story if you're in the call center. Uh, and then, of course, there's the ethical considerations, right? Uh, at the more and more we use AI, it's how are we using it? Are we using it for the right reasons? Are we getting information that is accurate, not biased, and doing the things that we need it to do uh, without causing negative consequences? Speaking of which, you know, what are the things that we need to think about uh, just as we wrap up here? Um, AI, I mean, has anybody heard the term dual use technology? It's basically, like nuclear is a good example of that, right? You can power a city uh, or you can blow it up. You know, with nuclear, right? So AI is a dual use technology. You know, as good as it is, the value it can create, the, the, the guardrails that governments can put in place, um, there's a lot of nefarious use of AI that can be done. There's just recently in February, uh, there was a story of this uh, company in Hong Kong. They had a Teams meeting or a video, online video meeting with this individual, the, the, the CFO and the finance team in the UK that he was talking to, wired $25 million transaction. That was the result of that call. Turns out that call was completely fake. CF, CFO was fake. The team members were fake. The call was completely fake. This individual was interacting with a deep fake. Uh, and I'm not sure what kind of governance they have in place that somebody can wire $25 million as a whole other conversation. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, this is this is real. So it can be used for bad things, right? I mean, we talk about robocalls to, to our parents and trying to get money and stuff like that. Well, what if, you know, a deep fake of the grandkid calls grandma and says, I need $5,000, can you send it to me? Don't tell mom and dad because I don't want to get in trouble. I mean, looks just like the grandkids, sounds like the grandkids, and then like, you know, FaceTime, it's not hard to do, right? So these are the, these are, these are things that need to be considered, and we need to figure, and, and, you know, there's bad actors out there in the world, uh, unfortunately, at, at country levels, uh, that are trying to use this tech, technology in bad ways, uh, including, you know, some of the foreign interference stuff that we've been hearing about. Um, we got a, we have a responsibility to use this stuff ethically, uh, including respecting customer data, customer privacy. Uh, we have to we have to consider the impact on jobs. You know, this isn't, you know, dollars and cents obviously is what it's all about at the end of the day. Um, but, you know, what is the impact to society in general? Uh, transparency is key. So how are you using AI so that people can trust how it's being used? Uh, because, and last but not least, misuse will just lead to government overreach uh, as well. Okay, so just to kind of wrap things up, uh, AGI is closer than we think. Uh, some people are measuring it in months, others in years, but we're getting there. Uh, it's definitely gonna be not too far off. Uh, it's gonna have a profound impact on society, particularly when we hit that point. Uh, where there's data, there's use cases, data is gold. So that's a real key takeaway here. Uh, accessible to everybody, particularly on the desktop. Start small. Look for areas of opportunity in your business. Where are your bottlenecks? Buy versus build. Talk to your vendors uh, and use AI responsibly and ethically. And let's hope the world doesn't end. <laughs> All right. All right. Thank you so much, everybody. <laughs>